Hi there, my name is Patricia. I am going to be helping you through the FAC 1503 May June 2014 exam. I've chosen this exam because it covers what most other exams have covered and I find they tend to repeat a pattern in terms of the May June exams they ask certain things and the October November exams they ask certain things. So in order to prepare you for this year's May June exam I'm going to go through last year's May June exam. I hope you find this video tutorial helpful and that if you do I hope you'll pass it on to all your friends and let them know what EDGE is all about and that you'll visit our website to see if there's any other exam courses that might assist you. Our website is www.ebs.co.za Right, let us begin with your exam from May June 2014. Question 1 is for 21 marks and 25 minutes little exam tip, something to help you in the exams, is make sure that you read the required before you start reading the question. If you read the required, you know what you're supposed to take from the question and you can answer the question as you go. They say in this one, analyze the above transactions in this table below. And this is basically your accounting equation. It's a theory question. They're asking you for whichever transaction date it is, which account will be debited, which account will be credited in the general ledger, and what is the effect on the accounting equation. Will your assets be increasing or decreasing? Same with equity and liabilities. Okay, you do not total the columns. You must put a plus sign to show that it is increasing and a minus sign to show that it is decreasing. It is not maths with a positive and a negative that you can leave off the positive. Very importantly, show any and all calculations you may do. In the exam, you do not have the luxury to read through the whole question first. You will immediately start with your answer. You will draw up your table. You get a blank piece of paper and that's what your table will be like. You obviously do not need to put their example into your table, but you prepare your page so that you can begin answering the question straight away. Okay, I am going to read through the question though to give you just some perspective of what's happening. When you do an accounting equation question, remember to follow the following steps. They're not really steps in, in, the, in the sense that you have to do them in this order. It's basically checkpoints or questions you need to ask yourself. The first question you ask yourself is, what are the two accounts that are affected with this transaction? So identify the two accounts. Remember, accounting is about the double entry system. For every debit, you need a credit. Once you've found what those two accounts are, you're going to decide where do they fit in. Are they assets, are they liabilities, or are they owner's equity? so that you can put them in the correct columns. And once they are in the correct columns, you're going to determine what is the effect of this transaction on the assets. Are they going up or down? On your equity or your liabilities, are they going up or down? And then once you've done that, different color because it's not really related, once you've done steps one and two, you're going to say, which account am I going to debit and which account am I going to credit? I'm going to teach you two little acronyms very quickly, DEAD and CLICK, and I hope they help you, but I find them very useful and most of my students have. The accounts that increase with debit entries are expenses, assets, and drawings. Accounts that increase with credit entries are liabilities, income, and capital. If that helps you, use it. If it doesn't, then don't. Um, if you look at owner's equity, owner's equity will decrease with expenses and drawings. So they affect negatively on owner's equity and that is why they are on the debit side. Whereas if you look at income and capital, they increase owner's equity. They affect owner's equity in a positive way. So while the account will be debited, owner's equity will be decreasing. Okay, so with that in mind then, let's read through the question. The following information relates to this company or this business. The entity is not registered for VAT. If it is registered for VAT, you need to show the VAT account, VAT input and VAT output as well. Periodic inventory system is used, which means you use the account purchases when you buy inventory. Right, and then they entered into the following transactions for June you purchased inventory to the value of 15960 on credit and a settlement discount of 10% will be awarded, not has been awarded, if 
the amount, sorry I see there's a little typo here, if the amount is settled within 30 days. And they intend to settle it within 30 days during August, but until they settle it, they won't get that discount. So you don't record stuff that's going to happen, you record things that have happened. So you are buying inventory, so the account is purchases when I buy inventory, and you're buying it on credit, which means you owe your creditors. If there was VAT, it would be VAT input, but we're not registered for VAT. Uh, number three says the owner paid his personal water and electricity account. As soon as it's personal, it is drawings, and there will be no VAT when the owner takes money for personal use. What he pays with it, you really don't care. He's taking a business check, so that means it's coming out of the business's bank account. Number seven, a debtor, so that will obviously involve your debtors. He paid us, so that would be bank, in full settlement of his account, and they don't tell us that he owed a different amount, so there's no discount involved. Um, that means he only owed five and he's paying five. And then we issued a credit note, so that's a sales return to somebody for goods previously sold to her on credit, so sales returns is my one account, and sold on credit means this is to do with a debtor. So you first identify the two accounts for each transaction. The next one, you sold, so your account is sales for when you sell stock, and you sold on credit, you sold doors and window frames on credit, so that means your debtors are involved again. Then you paid somebody in full settlement. The minute you pay, your bank is involved and you settled your account with these guys. So that means they are creditors, the people you owe. And the last one, a debtor, so the account debtors will be involved, owes the entity since whenever he's been declared insolvent. You need to write his debt off, which means we're going to have an expense called credit losses. Step one was identifying the two accounts. Now we're going to actually answer the question and fill it in. The first one, we bought inventory, so we know it's purchases. Purchases is an expense. We're going to debit expenses, assets and drawings. Expenses falls under owner's equity and decreases owner's equity. So let's fill that in. So on the date, sorry, on the third, we bought Inventory. Inventory falls under purchases. Purchases is an expense. So the inventory amount, 15,960, will fall under owner's equity. It's an expense which decreases the owner's wealth. You are buying it on credit. So creditors is the other account. It's a liability. So you put the amount in the liability column. You owe more, so your liabilities are increasing. Now the dead and click part, the which account do you debit, which account do you credit. Purchases, we said, was an expense. Debit, expenses, assets, and drawings. And credit, liabilities, like your creditors. Um, you may put the creditor's name if you do prefer. Uh, they don't tell you who they are, so you can't put their name. But if they do give you a name, you can put that there. Always check that your accounting equation balances. Assets must equal equity plus liabilities, and it does. The second transaction is on the 4th. There we go. On the 4th, the owner paid his personal water and electricity account with a business check, 1540-1540. The two accounts is drawings, because it's for personal use. And what did he take? Money. So it's drawings and bank. Drawings falls under owner's equity. Drawings falls under owner's equity. We debit expenses, assets and drawings and that will have a decreasing effect on my owner's equity. So let's go and fill this in on my table. The amount was 1540. Drawings is an owner's equity and bank is an asset. I have got less money, so I've got less assets, and drawings decreases owner's equity. Dead and click says debit expenses, assets, and drawings. I've got more drawings, which decreases the owner's wealth, and I have got less money, so I've got less assets, so debit the asset if it's increasing, but if it's not increasing, you don't debit.
The third transaction is on the 7th. A debtor, J. Armstrong, paid 5,000 Rand in full settlement of his account. So the two accounts are debtors, because that's where the money is coming from. He paid us, so it is bank. These are both asset accounts. So the 5,000 Rand is in the asset column. My assets are going up because I've got more money, and they're going down because I've got less debtors. Dead and click says, assets must increase on the debit side. So the asset that is increasing must be debited. My bank is increasing. Sorry, that's the seventh. So I will debit my bank. My debtor is the asset that is decreasing. So I will not debit my debtors. In other words, I will credit my debtors. Of course, you could put the debtor's name. And the debtor's name was J. Armstrong. So you could have put J. Armstrong in over there. OK. Uh, J. Armstrong. You could put his name in there instead of debtors, but debtors is perfectly good. The next transaction is on the 10th, where we, Brothers Manufacturers, issued a credit note, which means it's a sales return, to T. Habana. The amount is 1140 for goods previously sold to her on credit, which means she's a debtor. Remember, most sales returns will be with debtors. She returned the goods for whatever reason. We don't need to worry about that. We're on the periodic inventory system, so we only need to worry about the selling price and not the cost price. The two accounts is sales returns and debtors. Sales returns is an expense. I am losing profits. Debtors is an asset. I've got less debtors. When they bring stuff back, they owe me less. When I sell to my debtor, my asset will increase with a debit entry. But I'm not selling to my, as my debtor. He's bringing stuff back. So I won't debit the debtor. I will credit my debtors because my debtors are going down. Sales is an income. Click says credit liabilities, income, and capital. But sales returns is a loss of income. So you must write sales returns and not just sales. And it's an expense. You're losing money, so debit. You may also put the debtor's name, T. Habana, instead of writing debtors. You do not have to write both, though. So you could have put the debtor's name over there. Good. The next one. On the 23rd, we sold some doors and wooden windows on credit. So it's debtors and sales to you, Hala, uh, for 22,800 Rand. Sales is an income, which falls under owner's equity. More income, more profits for the owner. The owner will be wealthier. You are selling on credit. So debtors is an asset. Anything that is money or will become money is an asset. I've got more debtors, so my assets are increasing. The date was the 23rd. My debtors are increasing. My assets increase on the debit side, so I'll debit the debtors. My sales is an income. I credit my income when it is increasing. On the 29th, we paid... Somebody, Jomo Suppliers, in full settlement of our account, 57,000 Rand. If you look at the top transactions, these suppliers have not come up. We don't know who they are, or at least we don't know how much we owed them. We are paying a creditor. The two accounts are bank and creditors. Bank is an asset, 57,000 Rand under assets. Creditors are liabilities, 57,000 Rand under liabilities. I owe less, so my liabilities, my debt, is decreasing. I am paying money, so my assets, my bank, is also decreasing. That's the 29th. My bank is an asset, so debit the asset if it's going up, but my bank is not going up, it's going down. My creditors fall under liabilities. Credit the liability if they're going up. They're not going up, they're going down, so don't credit them, but debit them. So debit your creditors. In a nutshell, you debit what you buy, you debit what you pay for, and you could also put their name in there. So J. Lomo, ach, Jomo Suppliers, sorry. You can also put his, the supplier's name instead of creditors. Okay. And the last one, on the 31st, a debtor, T. Smith, or Smith at least, owing us 13500 since whenever, uh, since the 12th of June, 
is declared insolvent and his debt must be written off. So it doesn't matter how long he's been owing us, the debtor must be written off. So the asset must come down, 13500 We will not receive money in the future. And we are losing this money. Credit losses is an expense, decreasing the wealth of the owner. Credit losses, we will debit the expense because we are losing money. And we will credit the data because the data, the asset, which we normally debit if they're increasing, is decreasing. And we've got his name, T. Smith, which we can put instead of debtors. That's question one. Answered. Let's have a look how the marks would be allocated in a question like this. 21 marks. Okay, it seems that you will get a mark for the account debit, a mark for the account credit for each of these. And if you count that up, that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 entries. And then for each of these, the amounts were given. So for the signs, would be half a mark per sign. And the signs are independent of what's written on the left. So if your account debit and account, uh, account credit is wrong, you'll still get your marks for increasing your assets, increasing your equities, and so on and so forth. And the increase to liabilities is independent of the decrease to equities. However, if you put three things in there, for example, if you said minus 15,960 under assets, minus 15,960 under equity, and plus 15,960 under liabilities, they will not mark a single one correct because the, you don't give them multiple choice options. <laughs> they won't mark any. So make sure that the double entry effect says there must be two not three entries. And if you give them three, they will not mark a single one. So that's more or less how the marks would be awarded for a question like this. Let's have a look at question two. Question two is 20 marks, 24 minutes. As I said before, the first thing you do with any question is you read the required what do they want. They want you to calculate a couple of numbers, calculate the first four, net sales, which is your revenue, cost of sales, depreciation on vehicles, depreciation on machinery, and that would be for the current year. And then when you are done with that, you're going to prepare the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income for the year. So this is to do with your financial statements. So let's begin then reading the question. It's a calculation, so there's not much interpretation here. So to calculate your revenue, you remember, how do you do that? Revenue is your sales, and you don't have to write the words down, but it's sales minus what was returned and minus any settlement discount granted. We go and look at our information. We find there is my sales, there is my sales returns, and on my next slide, there's no settlement discount granted. In fact, I don't think that's in your syllabus at all they have taken it out as of two years ago. So that's quite a relief. Okay, so you won't deal with settlement discount granted. So you just say sales minus sales returns. 350,000 Rand is my sales. My sales returns were 7,000 Rand. So my net revenue or my revenue is 343,000 Rand. My cost of sales is opening inventory, opening stock, plus my net purchases, which is minus purchases returns. And if you had discounts, you'd minus those, but you don't have them. Plus any other costs like carriage on purchases. Oh, can't spell. Lucky spelling doesn't count too much. Carriage on purchases. And then we subtract my closing stock. And let's go and look at these, this information. 1st of January, as opposed to 31 December, that will be my opening inventory, the inventory at the beginning of the year. Purchases, oh dear, where's my purchases? Sorry, at the top there. My purchases is 212, my purchases returns is 5,000 Rand, and I don't have any carriage on purchases on that page. I also don't have anything else to do with purchases on this page and you will have to look at the additional information in order to find your closing inventory. 
So they tell you in the additional information that we use the periodic inventory system, that is why we are calculating cost of sales. You're not registered for that. And here you go is the information you are looking for. Inventory at the end of the year, that is my closing inventory or my closing stock, 18,000 Rand. So let's go and put those numbers into my calculation. Opening inventory or opening stock plus my purchases minus my purchases returns because that I didn't buy and that I didn't sell and minus my closing inventory. I don't have carriage on purchases and so therefore my cost of sales is 204,000 Rand. 3.3 .3 says calculate the depreciation on vehicles. Now in your information over here it says provide for depreciation as follows. On vehicles it is 20% per annum on the straight line method which means you take your cost price you multiply with the percentage 20%. So we go to my balances vehicles is not on this page vehicles is over there and you take your cost price and you multiply with that sorry you multiply with that 20% and you will get your answer. The cost price of your vehicles multiply with the depreciation percentage will give you 12,400. You need to know your formulas. The next question says calculate the depreciation on machinery and if you have a look here the depreciation on machinery is 10% on the diminishing balance method which means you take the cost price you diminish it you reduce it you minus your accumulator depreciation and then you multiply with that 10 percent so you'll take the cost price of your machinery subtract the accumulator depreciation on the machinery and then find your depreciation cost price minus the accumulated depreciation and then multiply with the 10% that they give you in the question. Okay, so you must distinguish between the straight line and the diminishing balance method. Okay, and that depreciation is 2975. The th fifth question says prepare the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. The statement begins with your heading. Makoloi Traders, this is the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income for the year ended 31st of December 2013. That full heading must be there. The name of the company can be on top or inside the sentence, but you must mention the name of the company and the name of the statement must be correct. If you look on your trial balance, we do have revenue, we've calculated it, and that then leads you to your layout. The layout you need to know because then you're just filling in the form. We begin with revenue. Now we've calculated revenue, so you can just take the amount that we got over here from 2.1, 343,000. So from 2.1, 343,000 Rand. The cost of sales, I'm not completely comfortable with just taking my answer. I'd rather go and show and disclose all my workings. That 204,000 is from 2.2 .2, which said take your opening inventory, add your purchases minus your returns which gave you 207,000 Rand and then subtract the closing inventory which is almost always going to be in your additional information. And the answer to this is your cost of sales. So put the answer on top, like Cremora. Right, so revenue, less your cost of sales, gives you gross profit. And this is all about accounting, not counting. So that's why you've got to disclose everything or present everything properly. If you look at your trial balance, we don't have any other income. Remember, income will be in your credit column. So if you look in the credit column, we've used our sales, we've used our purchases returns. These are to do with my assets. That is a liability. And capital is not an income. So we do not have other income. If you look on your list again, you will list all your expenses. We have used 
purchases and sales returns. Bank is an asset, debtors is an asset, purchases, no, never mind. Opening inventory, we've used machinery and vehicles are assets, those are your debits. So you will just go and list your expenses, insurance, not drawings, wages, admin expenses, rent expense, repairs and maintenance, light and heating. So here they are, all listed, copied and pasted from that list. Okay, and you take the amounts and you copy and paste straight from your list. So if you know the layout and you know which accounts are income and expenses, it is very, very easy. If you don't know your layout and you haven't learned which accounts are income and expenses, you're making your own life very difficult. There is a certain amount of studying in accounting. Let me just write that a little neater. Okay, those were the ones on the list. Then your hint is you calculated your depreciation in 3.3 and 3.4. Oops, here we go. Sorry, I see my numbering here is wrong. It should be 3. Sorry about that. Okay, so the depreciation on vehicles and machinery you have calculated. So you're going to add depreciation to your list and you're going to put those two amounts from those calculations 3.3 .3 and oh I've got too many zeros sorry I love doing that careful you need to know if you do that in the exam so plus let me just get my numbers right here 2975 and that was from 3.3 .3 and 3.4 add the depreciations no problem if you list them separately but it's much easier just to add them together. Okay, and then you add all your expenses and you put the answer again on top, like Cremora. So 68,875. So take your gross profit, subtract your expenses, and you will get your profit for the year 70125. And that is the answer to this question three. Let's have a look at the marks. 20 marks. Let's begin with my calculations. Hold on a sec. Here they say one mark for that, two marks for that, one and one and a half. So one mark would literally be a half for each amount. One, two marks for the second one. Yes, that's correct. And one mark for the third one and one and a half for the second. Each of those little copies are a half mark. So that was one there, two there, one there and one and a half over here. The statement of profit or loss, another comprehensive income was fourteen and a half. So for taking your answer right or wrong, don't forget your headings will most likely get marks. And then your answer, as I said, right or wrong, your, I'm not sure if they'd give you marks here again, so let's just stop there. Your cost of sales, right or wrong, subtotaling for gross profit, each of these were given for taking your amounts, right or wrong, so that's why you have to show your answers, and then they can carry your mistakes through. And let's just see where we are, one, two, three, four, five, six and a half. I really imagine that this needs to be shown here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sure. I'm not sure how they get to fourteen and a half. Right, the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Your headings are most likely going to get marks for bringing your answer through you get a mark for bringing your answer through you'll get a mark I'm not sure if you have to break it down for working out your gross profit you get a mark for adding up your expenses a mark each expense gets a full mark for bringing your depreciations on each one through you must show the totals over here and over here then you will get method marks but if you don't show those totals they will, can't carry them through down there to the bottom and we wanted 14 let's see 14 and a half let's see how far we are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 
I'm not too sure where the rest would be. Um, perhaps for adding them 13 and then 14 if you are right, otherwise a half a method mark if the rest is there, even if it's wrong, as long as your numbers give you that answer. And that's more or less where those 14 and a half marks would be. The next question is 18 marks and 22 minutes. Reading what they want, complete the bank columns of the cash receipts and payments journals, do the bank account properly balanced, and prepare the bank reconciliation statement. So this is a bank recon question. My advice to you, when you get your blank piece of paper in the exam, set out your templates cash receipts journal. I would leave it as a third of the left hand page. Remember, start each page. Start each question on a new page, so a double page. Cash receipts in the top third, let's say cash payments in the bottom part of the page, then a bank account. You'll, you won't need more than about five lines for your bank, but maybe leave a third of the page. And then the bank reconciliation statement, please put your headings exactly as they've given it here. Of Malaba traders, um, you don't have to use quite full wording, but the words Malaba Traders must be there and it will be, oops, not just November, 30 November as of the 30th of November 2013 this is the story you must know that bank is an asset dead and click said, debit expenses, assets and drawings bank increases on the left and goes down on the right but the bank reconciliation statement is the other way around Credit entries are pluses, debits are minuses. That's why it's a debit order, because it's a payment. And credit interest is receiving. Okay, so now that you know where you are going with your answer, when you read the question, you could just put the numbers in. You know that your bank account must start with a balance, but you don't know if it's favorable or unfavorable. You know your bank reconciliation statement must start with the balance as per the bank statement. And your wording doesn't have to be quite as full as it is in the study guide. You can write exactly what I have there, but you may not abbreviate. Your cash receipts journals, you will probably start with totals, but you can hang on and see what the information says. Again, a luxury you don't have in the exam. I'm going to read through the question first, and then I will fill it in on my templates that I've now prepared. The following information is then for the month ended 30 November 2013 for Malaba Traders. Remember for a bank recon question it's quite important to know what the company's name is. They begin then at number one that the credit balance in the general ledger, that's your T account, hey, has a credit which means it's a negative balance at the end of October that will begin November is 1,200 Rand. So that will go not to the bank recon, to your bank account in the general ledger, as I showed you earlier, on the credit side. Number two says there's an unfavorable balance, which means negative, according to the bank statement, and that will go to the bank reconciliation statement. The totals in the cash journals are as follows, cash payments and cash receipts. Please read carefully. They don't always give you receipts first and then payments. Then they say items appearing on the bank statement, but not in your journals. Means you're going to decide, must this go to my cash receipts or my cash payments? Because if they're not in my journals, I must put them in my journals. Except if it's a bank error, then the bank must fix it. So let's have a look. There is a deposit on the bank statement meant for somebody else. Can you see the spelling? We are Malaba, this is Mathlaba. Okay, so somebody else's deposit is recorded on our bank statement in error. The bank statement has this, so that's a bank error. So that must go to the bank recon as a bank error. The next one says bank charges appeared on the bank statement. Those are payments that I don't have, so I'm going to update my cash payments journal. A check issued by Al Lamlela, so somebody else wrote this check out. It was returned by the bank marked RD, so that means we received that check. 
and we issued a receipt and he doesn't have enough money in his account so now we need to cancel the receipt. Now the receipt was in the CRJ so to cancel it we will have to cancel it in the CPJ. Interest on your bank overdraft which means a negative bank balance is a charge appearing on the bank statement so it's another payment that I must update my cash payments journal with. And then there's a direct deposit made by somebody else for rent, so we assume that's our money, that is on the bank statement but not in my journals. So it is a receipt, so I'm going to update my cash receipts journal. Now, items appearing in the journal, so it's in my books, but not on the bank statement. Invariably, they will go to the bank reconciliation statement, except if it is our error then we must fix our error and not tell the bank to fix it. So there's a check in our journals issued on the last day of November to pay for water and electricity account that's not on the bank statement. That is an outstanding check that must appear on the bank reconciliation statement. There is a payment of 1212 made on the last day by a debtor. So in other words, it's actually a receipt in my cash receipts journal that is not on the bank statement and therefore I will show it as an outstanding deposit on the bank reconciliation statement. Number six is now a brand new topic. Check number this for 1772 issued to somebody, a creditor, was recorded as 2771. So that is the check amount and it was recorded as 2771 in the cash payments journal which is not correct. So 1772 is correct and 2771 is not correct. The mistake is in the journal, so we need to correct our error in our journals. We have put through too little in the original journal, which is the cash payments journal, so therefore we need to add the difference into the cash payments journal. The difference between what we wrote and what we or what we should have written and what we did write. If it was too much we would then cancel the difference in our cash receipts journal but our mistake must be fixed in our books. Number seven says there's a direct deposit which means somebody paid my money directly into the account. This is also for rent it was correctly recorded in the cash receipts journal. So it's in my journals, but it's not correct on the bank statement. On the bank statement, they've got 2,300 Rand, which is not correct. And this is a bank error. And the bank errors must be fixed by the bank, and the bank recon lists the items to be done by the bank. Okay, so. Let's go and read from the top and see where all the information goes into my templates I have prepared. Starting at number one, the credit bank balance in the bank account in the general ledger is 1,200. My bank account in the general ledger, there's my bank account. All you do in the exam is draw a T. It is a credit balance. Remember debit is left and credit is right. And that balance is on what date again? The end of October means we start 2013, November the 1st, balance brought down 1,200 Rand. The next bit of information says there's an unfavorable balance on the bank statement at the end of November of 152. So the unfavorable balance as per the bank statement, unfavorable 152. Number three says the totals of the journals is 11898 for the CPJ and 12987 for the CRJ. So we're going to begin with those totals, receipts and checks that we have already recorded and issued in my books and I'm just going to put those numbers straight into the cash receipts and cash payments. The cash receipts was 12987 and the cash payments was 11898. 
And then the next one, number four, items appearing on the bank statement but not in the cash journals is a deposit on the bank statement and it was for somebody else so there's a bank error so it must go to the bank recon. A deposit is money into our account so although we might not want to tell the bank about this we will know that they will fix this error and all you need to say is bank error tell me tell me what the error was it's a deposit somebody else's 263 Rand came into my account you can be quite sure they will take it back out and then at least when they do we'll know what it was about number two says there are bank sorry let me just take that off as we go then the second one says there's bank charges of 53 Rand I must update my cash payments journal and say these are my bank charges if they give you more than one just add them all together showing your calculation then number three or the third bullet point a check issued by somebody else was returned marked RD so there's an RD check to go into the cash payments journal to cancel the receipt from L Lamela usually it's a data even if they don't tell you otherwise they'll have to tell you and you say RD check and the amount 135 Rand interest on the bank overdraft of 128 rand must also be entered as another payment interest on the overdraft oh, I can't remember these amounts 128 rand is another payment what else a direct deposit made by a Atkins for rent is a cash receipt a Atkins rent direct deposit if you like the more information the better and how much was that amount 450 rand okay that page or number four is then sorted number five items appearing in the journals but not on the bank statement there's a check of 675 rand check number 610 and that was for water and electricity that's not on the bank statement so we will list it outstanding checks number 610 you must put the check number as well as the amount of the check 675 it'll come through as a debit because debits are payments oops wrong page and that one's done and then there's a payment that was made by a data in other words a receipt that is also not on the bank statement 1212 so you will say outstanding deposits they haven't appeared on the bank statement 1212 when they do there'll be a plus entry on the credit side number six check number 614 for 1700 and 72 was issued to Campbell a creditor was recorded as 2000 so it's not too little apologies it is too much in the cash payments journal so when you've got too much in the cash payments journal you will cancel in the cash receipts journal still the difference though so cash receipts journal you'll put C Campbell correction of check number what is that check number 614 614 and you will show your calculation the amount was 2771 that's what we wrote and we should have written 1772 and the difference is 999 you could have put it in the cash payments journal in brackets to decrease the cash payments journal my only concern is what if you ended up with the negative balance there at the bottom how do you post that to the ledger whereas if you put it in the cash receipts it'll always work then the last one here number seven a direct deposit was correctly recorded in your journals but the bank had too little the bank has got 2300 instead of 3200 so they need to deposit some more which is a credit so bank error for that deposit must go to the bank recon deposit 
composite, too little, so show your calculations. The difference between the two amounts is 900 Rand. They must deposit some more. So that is then our information dealt with. Once we are finished, we need to total my cash receipts journal and total my cash payments journal and post them to the general ledger. 2013, November the 30th, total receipts, and please remember you are not to abbreviate in the exam, 14436, November the 30th, total payments from my cash payments journal, 12214. If I balance this account now, you will see that the left hand side is still the biggest side. I want both sides to add up to 14,436 and you'll see that I'm missing an amount here. And with that amount, I will write balance to be carried down and that will start December, the first balance brought down. And that amount is 1022. And now, party trick for the exam, you take your amount, if it's on the debit side, and put it in the debit column. And you say this is the balance as per your bank account. Now in theory, your left column and your right column should be equal. In this case, they do. In the exam, you just take the side with the least numbers, add it up, and put the amount on the other side and it doesn't matter if it really doesn't add up to that you don't have time to check in the exam and that is your bank recon question let's have a quick look at the mark allocation seven marks for the journals cash receipts and payments and it's pretty much a mark for your total half a mark for each of these a half a mark for your details and sorry not that amount for your calculation you get a one mark half a mark for the total half a mark for each detail half a mark for each amount let's quickly see how many we've got here we needed seven one two three four five six and a half oh goodness who knows where maybe that one there seven okay then your bank account needs five marks it's fairly normal for that for writing total receipts from the cash receipts journal and posting your amount whether it's right or wrong now you'll see here that your total didn't get a mark but if you don't show that total they can't give you that method mark same with your cash payments journal for taking your amount here you will get pardon me a method mark the balance brought down the details and folio that's one two three for balancing it you will get those marks there so that is five marks six marks for the bank recon and that will basically be for the wording and the amount wording and the amount wording and the amount all the way through except for one two three four five and for balancing right or wrong you might get a half a mark so even if you didn't balance doesn't matter you lose the mark at the mistake but not there good and we are on question four Question 4 is 23 marks, 27 minutes. What they want required is calculate the following totals and ratios. So with that in mind, we are going to just begin once we've read the question. There's not too much calculations involved, but there is some additional information we mustn't forget. All formulas and calculations must be shown. Your answers must be rounded off to two decimal places after the comma. Okay, so the first question they ask us here is calculate your total assets. So let's tick those off in blue. My assets is my land and buildings, my debtors, my inventory for this year, not last year, my vehicles, my bank if it's favorable, and those are my total assets. So let's go and add them all together. Okay, you do not need to write your wording down. You can just do the calculation okay they didn't say show um, the wording they just said calculate so 476,000 is my land and buildings then I'm going to add my debtors I'm going to add my inventory for the current year I'm going to add 
my vehicles at carrying amount. I'm going to add my bank because it's favorable. And I'm going to add, hmm, that's it. So add your total assets, 816727. Very easy. The second question asks you for the acid test ratio. Now you need to know your formula. Your formula will get marks. Your acid tests is current assets minus your inventory or just current assets excluding your inventory over current liabilities. So let's go and see which of these are current assets. My debtors are current assets, my inventory is current assets, my bank is current assets. But they said excluding inventory. So let's go and do that. So current assets are my, let's quickly look, my debtors, 66164. We do not need to add the inventory and then subtract the inventory. That is a waste of time. So just leave it out. I'm just going to do that so that you don't think I forgot it. And then add your bank over. Let's look at current liabilities. Current liabilities would be my creditors, the short term portion of my loan, and that's pretty much it. The additional information is just telling you about how much of the sales are cash and credit, so that's no influence on those. So let's go and add those together. My current liabilities is my creditors, 80470, plus the short-term portion of my loan. You don't have to subtotal if you don't want to, unless you're going to use that number again somewhere. Very unlikely, so you can go straight to the answer. And the answer is 0, 0,77. Oopsie, try that again. 0, 0,77 and all you do is say colon 1. They did not ask you to interpret anything, they just said calculate. So number 3 then, 4.3. The inventory holding period, your formula is your average inventory over cost of sales multiply with 365 days. Now your average inventory would be your inventory for last year and your inventory for this year divided by 2. So inventory for last year plus inventory for this year, add them together and then divide by 2 will give you average inventory. Your cost of sales is not on this list, but if you look at D, it says your cost of sales is 283731. So put that at the bottom, 283731. Once you've got that answer, you'll multiply with 300 and 65 days and your answer is 128,4 days I don't know what stock you're selling but that's a long time to keep it on your shelf the next one is your gross profit percentage the formula for your gross profit percentage is your gross profit on your sales multiply with 100 here you do have your sales and here we have already established my cost of sales so that is your gross profit Gross profit is your sales minus your cost of sales, as you already know from your financial statements. 400,000 Rand minus your cost of sales, 283,731, over your sales. Multiply with 100 so that you can show it as a percentage, and that will give you the answer of 29,07 percent two decimal places after the comma okay so this answer should have had another decimal then the next question asked you for the return on assets return on assets the formula is your profits before your interest and tax over total assets and to find the percentage now your profit for your year is 3 to 200 here they tell you there was no tax so before tax is still the same, 3 to 200. But before finance costs means before I paid 6,200 Rand, what was my profits? So 32,200 was after I paid interest. If I unpay the interest or add it back, I will get my profits before interest and tax. At number 4.1, I calculated my total assets. So if I take that answer and use it in here, 816727, you will get a method mark. 
even if you got it wrong and that is 4 comma 7 0 and the last one is your solvency ratio solvency is total assets over total liabilities now once more you have calculated your total assets 816727 can you see why they ask you to total it or to add them up your total liabilities remember in the asset test ratio you've got your current liability so this helped the fact that you've subtotaled because now you can use that number and all you need to do is go and look for your non-current liabilities okay so if we look down our, down our list here we've got the short-term portion of the borrowings we've also got the long-term borrowing so if we just add 500,000 to my current liabilities 90470 plus the long-term borrowings of 500,000 and that will give you oh sorry not times 100 the answer will be 1 comma 3 8 to 1 and lastly quickly the mark allocation two and a half marks for your total assets literally a half a mark each will give you that two and a half marks the next one is five and a half marks so one two um, three and possibly I'm not too sure if you would have had to add that and then subtract it it's a bit silly to do that but perhaps show that like that um, and then your answer or let's rather say your answer and the correct answer so a method mark if even if you got it wrong one two three four five how many marks did they want five and a half my goodness me one two three four perhaps that would be a full bonus mark if you got it right sometimes they give such free marks okay the next one is four marks inventory holding period it would be sorry your formula adding those two numbers dividing by that one two halving that multiplying with 365 um, one two three how many do they want four maybe there I'm not too sure if these would get marks here so let's rather take them away just rather be on the safe side perhaps a method mark and a mark if you are correct one two three four yeah and then the next one is three and a half marks just to be consistent there gross profit on sales gross profit on sales that's one two and then three and a half marks the usual over there then the last second last one is three and a half and then four for your formula each number substituted in and same process there would give you one two three oopsie one two three four marks we don't want four we want three and a half mm. perhaps let's just say half method and a half full that so three and a half marks and then four over here and that would give you those four marks there just to give you an idea of how they allocate marks in the exam okay and our last question question five 18 marks 22 minutes what do they want prepare the following subsidiary journals the trust cash receipts the trust cash payments and the business cash payments make provision for the columns they don't always tell you what columns to use but hopefully they'll be nice so what you do is you divide your page into three and you draw up your trust cash receipts or payments sorry let me just see I've got mine the opposite way around so just be aware of that trust cash payments trust cash receipts and the business cash payments right as you read through the information let's go and mark off which of those journals it will go to the following information pertains to ANCO attorneys practice for the for January 2014 you paid the office rent so that would be the business cash payments journal 
you paid the water and electricity for the office, so that would be the business cash payments journal. You received 750 Rand from somebody in respect of a job to be done, so that would be the trust cash receipts journal, because that's not your money. You drew a check to restore petty cash, so that is a business payment. You paid an advocate with a trust check, so that would be trust cash payments journal. You paid the sheriff, and remember when you pay a sheriff, you take the chance that you can recoup your money, so that's a business check, so it's a business cash payments journal. On the 17th, you paid the net amount received from this guy to the entrusting attorney. So in other words, that was a trust cash receipts originally when you received the money and now you are paying out of the trust cash receipts. So it's trust cash payments journal because you're paying as per his instructions. Then you bought office supplies, so it's the business cash payments journal and you received money from a client who requested you to do something on their behalf, so that is the trust cash receipts journal. Okay, just confirming number 17, the, the trust cash receipts was recorded, so you don't need to still record it. And then you issued a debit note, which means it was the fees journal. And that won't come into any of the ones they asked for. Then a check was received in respect of a registration, and that check was marked RD. Now, N. Edwards is somebody we've heard of before. At number five, in Edwards, it went into the trust cash receipts. So when the check bounces, it'll go out the trust cash payments. Debited fees will go to the fees journal, which we weren't asked for. We drew a check to pay wages. That's a business payment. And we paid the telephone account, also business payment. Okay, so let's go and enter these into my journals. I paid the rent, business cash payments. So on the first, business cash payments, you don't know who you paid, you can just put a description here, rent expense, you are paying 7800 and the sundry account would be for rent expense. The second transaction, you paid the water and electricity account of 980, that was the amount for the previous one, 980, it's also business expense, so business cash payments, water and electricity, goodness me, and the amount was 980 rand. The third transaction, you received money from Edwards, trust cash receipts journal, 750 rand. So on the fifth, you received money from Ed N. Edwards, and he is now a trust creditor because you owe him what he's paid for, or you need to give him his money back. So he's a trust creditor, and he's entrusted you with his money. Then, number nine, you drew a cash check to restore petty cash, 500 rand, so that's a normal business cash payment, petty cash. The amount was 500 rand. Number 11, you paid an advocate with a trust check, 520 rand. That The name of the ad advocate is K, whatever, in Yenza, and it was for defense of S. Smith. So it's a trust, cash payments, and you will say it is on behalf, on the 11th, of S. Smith who is a trust creditor, he must have given you money, otherwise you couldn't issue a trust check. And you will say, what is this for? Because on his statement, you need to say what you paid. And the advocate is Ken, whatever that surname was, Yenza. Oh, sorry that I'm squashing here. 520 Rand in both columns. Number 14. Again, you paid the sheriff this time for delivery of summons, 35 Rand, and F. Krantz is the comp the sorry, the client. So here you would say on the 14th, you would say Sheriff. Oh, sorry, I can't spell Sheriff. 
like it's spelt in the exam and he is a client and you would possibly put the client's name if you like but not entirely necessary okay and the amount of that check was then 35 rand then number 17 you paid the net amount you received from J Hodson on the, and you paid it to an instructing attorney so it's a trust cash payments and you put the the client's name down J Hodson and you say that he is a trust creditor and what are you paying for let's just quickly read there the instructing attorney is R Derby so you could have put a little details in brackets here instructing attorney Derby and the amount of that check was 1100 double check yep 1100 on the 19th he bought office supplies so it's a normal business cash payments of 375 um, office supplies just call it what they've called it could be anything from toilet paper to coffee and tea 375 rand and the next one on the 21st you received 480 rand from L Malemoni who's a client who wants you to do something for him in the future so on the 21st R Malemoni who is now a trust creditor and I suppose you could use dittos in the exam 480 rand that's almost done on that page number 25 you issued a debit note that's the fees journal they didn't ask us for that 27 you issued a check f oh sorry a check received for 750 from in Edwards was returned by the bank so trust cash payments journal 27 write his name in Edwards who is a trust creditor and you write why is it in the payments journal because it's an RD check of 750 Rand the next one is you debited fees and that means it will go to the fees journal you do a tech check for 1350 to pay wages that is a business check so you say wages 1350 sorry I see that's written very badly I just want to rewrite it so that you can actually read it okay and our last one then on the 31st we paid the telephone account or even if it's for the previous month and we put it into the business cash payments because it's a business expense 1150 and those are the journals so at the end you will total them up however they normally will say don't total them but if they don't say anything please total them up okay and you finished the question three marks for the trust cash receipts journal and that would be one two three oops a daisy sorry maybe not because they're either right or wrong so in both columns then three marks for the trust cash receipts four and a half for trust cash payments let's have a look for the details column for the explanation bits and for writing trust creditor oh I think I've already got too many marks here try that again not for writing trust creditor and then for the amounts so that's one two three four and a half marks sorry for all the details you'd get the half mark then the last one is for ten and a half marks and that would be for each of the details and for each of the amounts and as you can see they're in both columns so that would be one two three four five six seven now how do they want ten and a half marks then seven perhaps each amount got a mark who knows so that would be seven eight nine ten and a half okay they're not always consistent in their marking but that is more or less where your marks could be allocated in an exam I think you've seen what is important in an exam and when you answer a question what you need to show. I wish you all the best for your exam and visit our website as I mentioned earlier 
to see if there aren't any classes that you could attend or exam courses that you could attend to help you with the exams and f for more information. All the best then, good luck.